Well, okay, it's uh, 11.25. I hope you had a, a good break. Uh, now it's time for our, the last session. I introduce you the chairman of the session, Ian from the Ephraimer. Uh, so please, Ian, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Ricardo. Good morning to everyone. Uh, I have the honor to uh, chair the second session this morning uh, in MRAT 21. Uh, the um, general theme of this session is uh, technology and applications for seafloor monitoring uh, and exploration. And we will have five talks in for a duration, total duration of 75 minutes and some time for discussions. So I'd ask the speakers to respect a duration of 10 minutes and uh, we have to, maybe we'll have directly time for one or two questions and then we can have a longer discussion at the end of the session. Uh, so the first speaker, I welcome uh, Daniel Alberto Galliano from the GRC uh, European uh, Joint Research Center. Uh, uh, he will present technology for sea monitoring. Good morning. Uh, I am uh, happy to be here for the, the first time and uh, I will uh, start immediately presenting. Okay, I hope now to... Okay. Okay. I am not very familiar with the uh, is uh, okay this technology but uh, you should be able it's okay, to yeah okay thank you and um, i'm very happy to be here for the for the first time i work for the joint research center that is the scientific service of the european commission specifically in the disaster risk management unit for the, the project that is involved in applying technology to the crisis management what uh, I am uh, presenting uh, today is uh, the outcome of a long path that started in 2009 when GRC patented the tsunami alerting device, a device that is meant to warn the population in case of uh, alerts. The first one was uh, deployed in 2011 in Stubal, Portugal. And, uh, uh, in the meanwhile, uh, we started uh, building uh, our the own uh, grid of sensors uh, together with partners. And in 2014, uh, we uh, developed the first uh, prototype of the inexpensive device for sea level measurement. In uh, 2015, uh, we performed the first exercise on automatic activation of a tsunami alerting device, thanks uh, to the um, presence of uh, alerting signals uh, on a uh, um, sensor. In 2016, we deployed the first uh, IDSL and uh, started the first IDSL campaign funded by UNESCO in order to provide the Mediterranean area with uh, this uh, low-cost device for sea level measurements. In 2017, we started the development of a new platform for the, this kind of device called, called remote interoperability. In the, and the second campaign, again funded by UNESCO, started and in 2018, we had the first radio device that was uh, the new version of the tsunami alerting device. And the third, uh, um, for the third year, UNESCO decided to, to found a, a campaign. In 2019, uh, out of all these development, uh, we deployed our oceanographic buoy. 
and uh, we also performed an exercise in a course boardroom, the playing the 2017 tsunami, uh, to study how to warn the population and create a prompt um, response to this situation started from automatic uh, um, detection of uh, these uh, of these conditions and in 2021 uh, we performed uh, some tabletop exercises uh, with uh, Malta that will lead to a full-scale exercise again before the end of this year okay we have uh, the four two uh, main uh, um, approaches uh, the one that is based on devices that are uh, deployed on the coast for this we developed uh, this inexpensive device uh, that is uh, low cost but it is not cheap i mean uh, it uh, performed very well it is uh, reliable it is very sensible and uh, it provides uh, more interesting data than uh, many other uh, um, less modern <laughs> sensors deployed in the Mediterranean area that for us involves uh, also the Black Sea and the northeast uh, of Atlantic. And in fact, uh, we, had a we have now a constellation of more than 40 um, devices in this area and uh, in uh, Indonesia, in uh, near the Krakatoa area. But uh, all these uh, devices are based uh, on the coast, uh, and uh, in order to have an earlier warning about uh, tsunami, it is more interesting to have uh, something deployed in the open sea. And uh, for this, uh, we investigated the, the differential GPS approach. Um, so we compared the observation of the same uh, satellite constellation from two different antennas, one located on the coast and the, the other one located on a buoy, on a floating device. And the results are very, very um, good because uh, you can see here a comparison of uh, three uh, detection. The green one is uh, from the buoy. The um, purple one is uh, from a sense of one of our partners uh, located in the same uh, arbor. And the other one is uh, an EDSL device that uh, was located uh, far from this, uh, but uh, the accord uh, is, is very good. Oops. Uh, we had uh, we, we met some problems uh, for the for this uh, development. The main one are that uh, uh, we need two devices: uh, one on the coast and one on um, and one that is floating and must receive all the observation of the satellites from the one on the coast. Uh, this uh, means that we we need a very uh, reliable co data connection for the floating device. But uh, uh, the new uh, GNSS receivers are now able to elaborate data coming from the satellites uh, and uh, perform the same computation uh, by themselves. This uh, could be a good improvement for, the, for these devices. As a matter of fact, we had more problems uh, on uh, the device on the coast that, uh, that, than uh, the one floating. And the other uh, problem is, of course, that uh, we need the data uh, collected uh, by the device to be sent uh, to our uh, uh, infrastructure in order to get uh, the telemetry and the alerts. And uh, uh, the problem is uh, that um, in the open sea is difficult to, to rely upon uh, uh, 3G that is no longer available, 4G on 2G, and. Um, we tried with the radio links and we met a very a lot of problems so that was not a, a viable solution the problem is that um, the so obvious solution using satellite link is expensive but should be investigated the setup on the other end is quite simple uh, we have uh, of course batteries uh, power management and solar panel everything is based on a raspberry pi that is uh, the election platform for the rio uh, software and uh, we use a simple gsm modem um, we we have uh, many systems to communicate uh, we can also uh, cope with the communication failure, but the infrastructure is very, very simple with uh, 
very very small expense uh, you can have the same it, it is important to have a web entry point uh, and uh, a um, communication infrastructure we use uh, redis queues uh, but uh, uh, whatever can be used uh, signal r and tqq and, and so on because uh, one of our uh, main goal is the sustainability of these projects. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the more uh, the, the, the IDSL is uh, less than 2,000 uh, kilo, uh, 2,000 euros, while uh, um, the boy uh, is uh, okay, expensive, but not compared to the two million devices uh, deployed in the oceans uh, usually. So something that uh, could uh, be used uh, in order to um, implement uh, a sensor grid uh, of the Mediterranean that is, uh, in my perception, uh, very poor at the moment. Uh, the installation uh, is, uh, okay, una tantum, so you have to perform only once, uh, and uh, it is not that, uh, that expensive uh, in, um, in the total. For the for the future, uh, we we already outlined uh, the you the difference the, the improvements that uh, we wanted to, um, to try uh, using a single uh, GNS receiver or the, um, the satellite connection. At the moment, uh, um, we are in the process of refitting the buoy that had a navigation accident so that uh, a solar panel was uh, destroyed and um, antennas were lost uh, in the sea and we don't know who to thank for this and uh, but we received uh, um, a letter of interest from uh, uh, from spain with um, and uh, with collaboration with ign uh, we are going uh, to have a longer campaign uh, more than uh, the uh, already performed 18 months uh, that we have uh, to, um, uh, to to try new um, new experiments uh, because uh, um, as it is uh, designed it is a platform that can host many other um, experiments so that uh, it can be fit with additional uh, sensors and uh, their observation can be transferred with the same uh, means to the to the infrastructure i think i'm uh, on time okay great you're perfectly uh, almost on time uh we have uh maybe time for one quick question i don't see one in in uh, the chat but i would have one uh there are networks of seismic sensors uh, uh to alert on on strong seismic events and uh, is there a perspective to link uh, your your network of uh, tsunami alert uh, to such seismic observations or is this oh. a perspective as a matter of fact uh, in the large family of our devices uh, we also account for uh, seismometers uh, so we developed our own uh, for the um, to integrate the the network and in fact we used one in the exercise uh, in uh, in course on the other hand uh, uh, we use uh, uh, standard uh, protocols and formats uh, so that uh, we can easily connect uh, with the uh, legacy systems uh, with other system with other alerting system and with uh, um, other uh, sensing uh, networks so it is extremely easy for us uh, to integrate with them. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel, for, for this talk. And I uh, really appreciate the, to see the, the application for, for, for civil security, which is an important uh, uh, aspect. Um, thank you for um, um, unsharing the screen. Okay, thank you for the next speaker. Uh, who is Fabio Bruno from the University of Calabria? Uh, and uh, Fabio will talk about uh, BlueMed, the BlueMed project, and uh, uh, related tectonic projects. And maybe we see a link there. What's the first topic? Yes. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks to the organizer for the invitation. 
So I hope you are looking at my screen. You see? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for confirming. So yeah, I will talk about two projects. One is Blume, that is an interreg med project that is com was completed uh, last year, just before the COVID pandemic, and the Tectonic, that is a mercury a rice project that is started, but it has to, um, to, start, to start with the, the actual uh, activities. I mean. Uh, so, uh, I will give you just a brief presentation of myself and my university since it is one of the first time, is the first time uh, that I participated in uh, this kind, in this particular kind of conference or AMA. And uh, then I will talk about BlueMed, where we will see something about the 3D recording of the, let's say, the water cultural heritage and the two different applications that are related to the Enhancement to, to make it easier the accessibility to the underwater cultural heritage sites that are the virtual diving for world's not divers so that enable them to visit the site and the augmented diving to provide more uh, interesting experience for uh, the divers. We will talk about the demonstration and transferring activities of this project because these are mainly projects that probably you know the interreg that are related to the development of best practice studies and demonstration and transferring, not really to technological development. And also the tectonic, we will see how we, we are going to continue the, the experience made in BlueMed in order to improve the methodologies for underwater cultural heritage conservation and uh, uh, all we plan to do is about uh, the autonomous 3D recording. So the University of Calabria is a, a medium university in Italy with 30,000 students. It's located in the south of Italy in the, the region of Calabria that's here. So it's a small region but with 800 kilometers of coast, uh, uh, good uh, industrial tourism, uh, good tourism of um, industrial tourism, and then uh, we are really much really motivated with the, uh, everything that is related to the sea, and in particular to the sea tourism. Uh, we also uh, invested a lot in spin-off companies, that, uh, uh, and in particular to the ones related to underwater technologies. Uh, so we have three companies that, are, that strongly cooperate with our projects. Uh, Applicon that may, it works about underwater communication localization, providing some modems and localization techniques. 3D research that is specialized on 3D reconstruction and virtual reality and augmented reality is particular for underwater application. And tech 4 c that works about underwater mechatronics, in particular for divers, but also uh, for divers, but also for uh, let's say robotics application. So what? Are in common Bluma. Mainly the intertonic. Uh, mainly they share some the, the same goals because both of them are focused on the protection and the promotion of underwater cultural heritage as a means of developing uh, economy and tourism in uh, coastal areas and uh, small islands. So we uh, are working about uh, the tele 3D recording of the shipwrecks uh, employed both. Uh, divers and uh, autonomous vehicles, both from surface and underwater. Uh, we are working a lot about the accessibility and the valorization of uh, these sites by developing underwater uh, virtual reality application. And uh, with the colleagues so from other departments, uh, we work a lot about the restoration techniques and methods and tools. and. Uh, the new materials for protecting the water, the, uh, the, the, the cultural heritage. So, Bloomed is a project that has been closed uh, in 2020, January 2020, after three years and a uh, few months of development uh, with a budget of something less three millions of euros. And the goal was to develop an underwater museum, diving park, and knowledge awareness center in order to support a sustainable, responsible tourism in the coastal and island of the Med area. Uh, so it was a quite big partnership uh, with uh, some, uh, let's say, from Greece, Italy, Croatia, Cyprus, Spain, with uh, many, let's say, public authorities and uh, some very few uh, 
technical partners, uh, in particular, we were uh, University of Calabria, University of Zagreb, with a group of Nikola Muskovich collaborating in the development of the methods for uh, recording them the world cultural heritage. Uh, so what we have done mainly is a demonstration of the technology. So there was not some big development there, uh, but just uh, an integration of existing methods and techniques and uh, the demonstration to the public authorities in order to uh, train and explain them what they can do with this kind of stuff. So uh, we use uh, the University of Zagreb employed the ASV um, equipped with the multi beam microsounder from Norbit and the navigation system and the geolocalization uh, in order to provide the, the general bathymetry of the area. And with the, an AUV equipped with a side scan sonar and a camera in order to uh, create um, photomosaics and uh, side scan sonar maps of the area in order to also to give archaeologists more information about the stuff. Uh, then we, uh, we use a photogrammetry both for aerial reconstruction and the water reconstruction and we fuse it together in a, a complete a model of the underwater part and the surface part. So here you can see something about the, how we use it, these, these, uh, these three models. In an virtual replication provided uh, for the ATC by the market display, where we have put together all the uh, seven sites that we are working in Croatia, Greece, and Italy. So you can choose at the beginning of the site, uh, having some information about it, and uh, then you can start diving in the site that you have chosen. Uh, you start from the surface looking at what you are, uh, at the surrounding environment. And then using the point of view, you can start, dive, go down, and uh, reach the sea bottom to see, uh, let's say, the, uh, the cultural site. So here we are in Peristela, where there is a very impressive uh, cargo shipwrecks from the third um, century before Christ, with something like uh, 3,500 downfalls. <coughs> and you see the environment is reconstructed in a very quite realistic way. And uh, uh, there are some points of interest spread around the, the area where that you can uh, in, uh, interact, you can activate in order to listen uh, some description of both the biological point of interest and the archaeological one. So in order to retrieve some information about that. Uh, we have installed this kind of systems inside the so-called knowledge awareness centers that are considered as let's say, the entry point for the people that want to learn about the water archaeology in the area, so to both tourists and local people. Uh, there are obviously the, um, the, the virtual reality application, but also standard, let's say, traditional uh, instruments like uh, panels, uh, projection videos, and uh, also a virtual museum with some uh, finds uh, coming from uh, the sea bottom. We have two different knowledge urban centers in Greece, one in Amaliapolis and one in Alonisus in, um, on the island, on the Sporades Island. So you see that there are also some replica of amphoras and a lot of panels, video and so on. One uh, for who has been also located in Sabtat because there were two uh, shipwrecks that we reconstructed. Um, that were Roman time, from the Roman time. And here you see there are also a different layout. All the layout was, the layouts were designed inside, and realized thanks to the project. Here, the, the last one that was located in Croton, where we also um, developed this uh, big ground screen for making, let's say, something more immersive presentation. And there are also a touch screen for biological content. We did a lot of training and dissemination because uh, um, it, it is a very important part of the interact projects. Another stuff that we did and uh, mainly experimented and demonstrated in the project is an underwater tablet equipped with an acoustic localization system that provides to the diver some information about the site that they are visiting. So we use uh, the um, acoustic localization system provided by Applicon that use a uh, uh, short baseline configuration with one-way communication. So thanks to atomic clock, uh, the base and the tablet are synchronized 
and then we can triangulate uh, in the, the, for, uh, retrieving the position of the tablet. Um, we use it one way because we would like to have uh, more tablets uh, with a good update, uh, and then in that way we reduce the need to let's say to to, to wait. To, um, that, let's say the update rate is independent from the number of tablets. That is possible only when you use single uh, one-way communication. Uh, we use uh, two configuration uh, for uh, the uh, for um, let's say for the beacons uh, for the transmitting beacons. One is with the, this cross fixed to the C button uh, that can be removed, uh, place uh, put it in place at the beginning of the dive and removed at the end of the dive. And the other uh, was by uh, using the uh, autonomous surface vehicle uh, from Universal Zagreb. Uh, the Plydipos platform, uh, so we will keep it also here, the, the, the localization system. Fabio, uh, me, uh, you will need to wrap up. Yeah, I'm going to the conclusion. So there are some other, let's say, we experimented the system and we also they, they are worked on the augmented reality using the tablet. Uh, so there are the Bloomed Plus now starting that is will continue the project and we will and uh, we will uh, let's say transfer the results in new territories in um, uh, in Albania, Montenegro, and Bosnia. The tectonic pro uh, project that is just started because uh, uh, due to the pandemic it was suspended. There is a magic reaction and. Uh, in which we want to develop new materials for the protection and uh, also method for to forecast and to study uh, the degradation process. That was also thanks to artificial intelligence. And also, we will continue to work on virtual and augmented reality. It's a mainly uh, a, a work of training and exchange skills and uh, people among the partners uh, between, let's say, private and public partnership. And uh, we will have three different uh, parasites in Italy, uh, Argentina, and Greece. Thanks for listening. Sorry for the two minutes that I spent more on uh, more of my time. And these are the, the let's say the link to the various projects that we are running. The presentation is on the Google Drive, so you can download it. Thank you very much, uh, Fabio. This is so interesting. And uh, would have a very quick question. Um, is there yeah. do exist uh, platforms for remote access to these virtual visits, or is this reserved today for uh, the the site uh, uh, awareness uh, knowledge awareness sites you mentioned, or are there perspective to to go uh, online? Okay, so we have both in the sense that um, in the Knowledge Awareness Center, you have the full experience, let's say, with the, the FTC Vive, where you can say uh, the tailored and with everything. And we have also uh, an online platform for visiting the, through the uh, through a web GR window to visit the, the, all the sites that we have reconstructed. Obviously, since it is running on the web browser, it, they are much more, let's say, simplified models. But you can still visit them. Okay, um, that's all. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, um, if you would uh, yeah, share your screen for the next speaker. Well, sorry, I am. Ah, okay. So the next speaker will be uh, Andrzej Zawski. I hope I. Not uh, uh, do. <laughs> uh, and uh, Andrzej is uh, from ITU Denmark and will talk about uh, reliability questions of artificial intelligence. Uh, okay. Uh, now I understand why everybody is a bit confused because all the speakers have problems with screen sharing and Zoom doesn't seem to behave as it normally does, but I will try to do my best. <laughs> uh sure maybe this works it's okay yep uh, so my name is uh, andrzej wasowski and i work in denmark at IT university of copenhagen 
and I do feel uh, excited to be here and uh, to listen all your talks, but I also feel very alien because what I normally do is software engineering research. Uh, but I'll be speaking on behalf of the project I'm coordinating, the Marie Curie uh, Innovative Training Network Remaro, Reliable AI for Marine Robotics. Uh, uh, so we have other experts than myself in this training, in these training networks. I know primarily about software safety, uh, reliability, uh, and in machines operated by software uh, that I have been researching for many years. But I, of course, have experts in the consortium who know also about AI and uh, building or uh, deploying marine robots and, and uh, applications. Uh, this project is also slightly different than many projects that have been presented uh, because it's a Marie Curie action, uh, uh, also slightly in the same funding, uh, the same funding agency as in the previous talk, but a different uh, instrument. So our primary deliverable is not really an infrastructure for research or a, a, a robot that has a new skill or a better precision or a, a better range, but our primary deliverable is 15 PhD projects in this area. Uh, so the focus is on uh, educating and creating experts uh, that are going to change, uh, to change the economy in this sector in years to come. Uh, not so much on actually creating technology. Of course, the education happens by the research, so they will also create technology, but uh, they they don't work in such a coordinated manner like in other projects where you have a common demonstrator or a target. Uh, they more have a common topic so that they can benefit from each other, and uh, and from and they have some collaborations, but they don't create a common product. Uh, okay, so uh, our initial motivation. Uh, comes from uh, industrial applications of marine robotics. Uh, so uh, it's probably the only picture I will show because software engineers never show pictures in talks, uh, like, unlike you. Most of you have beautiful pictures and, and videos. So uh, we are talking about uh, the sector of the economy that deploys uh, robots like the one on the picture, this uh, visualization. It's actually not a robot from this project, uh, but the application could well be. Uh, so we're talking about inspection and maintenance of installations underwater. Could be oil and gas, but could also be uh, could also be other power installations, uh, wind energy, or uh, fishing installations, or maybe also oceanographic uh, applications and research applications. Many of you have uh, shown them. The problem is that when uh, when we are deploying the autonomous robots uh, in these spaces, we would like to be sure that the robot itself. Uh, will not cause damage, right? So we don't want the robot to destroy the uh, uh, installation. Quite often, uh, the destruction of these installations is dangerous. If it's uh, if it's some kind of mining, it could cause a leak uh, or a gas leak, or and it could cause uh, natural disasters. It could also cause uh, huge uh, uh, huge uh, financial damages. The robot itself is not cheap, but the installation typically is even more expensive. So basically, like in any other autonomy area, we would like to be sure that uh, that what we are deploying is safe. So companies that normally deploy safe uh, mach uh, machinery, uh, they have safety standards, and we would like them to be able to deploy uh, to apply these safety standards. But employing safety standards in robotics is very difficult. One reason for this is that we don't really understand what reliability for AI means and how to achieve it. So. Uh, this is uh, the topic that uh, the Remaro network tackles. Uh, we want to look at reliability of AI, particularly in the context of marine robotics. Uh, you could ask why in the context of marine robotics. Uh, there is so many, uh, so many, you know, other applications of uh, AI, and maybe this is a topic that should be looked upon outside a particular application. Maybe you should just take, I don't know, convolutional neural networks and talk about their reliability. The problem is that safety and reliability can rarely be assessed without an application at hand. Uh, the, the, anybody who works with safety and reliability knows that you have to look at the system and you know you have to assess what's the impact of a component in the system underperforming or not performing. So you cannot really take uh, the question of reliability of AI completely separately from applications. And we thought marine robotics is an excellent application. Uh, so we decided uh, to focus on that. And our angle uh, to this 
well, we, I don't have much to present because we have just started. We have started about half a year ago. And uh, the way my networks work, the first uh, almost a year, you kind of started up after we have just hired almost 15 uh, young researchers that will work with us. So in the fall, we will start to research these topics and I maybe in a year or two, I'll be able to present some results. But I can tell you how we, uh, how we intend to do this. So uh, we have a group of experts on AI and robotics who want to work on making the methods they already use more reliable. So here is the idea is not to invent the new neural network kind or a, a new kind of a controller or a perception device, but it actually is to look at what we are already using and asking the question, how can we make it more reliable uh, uh, so, so that it produces less false positives or, or, or uh, mislocalization or localization is more precise, et cetera. So we're talking about methods like sensor fusion or including probabilistic Bayesian reasoning into existing setups, uh, et cetera. So that uh, companies uh, have methods which they can later use to argue that they can, they can sell to the customers that the machines they are selling, uh, the marine robots are safe. Uh, in parallel, uh, there is a group of researchers in the project in, uh, who are experts in, like me in software engineering and formal methods. We know a lot about testing, about reasoning about systems, and we want to take these uh, marine robotics systems as a case study and we will apply everything we know about testing and uh, verification of these systems to, uh, to check, uh, to see whether we can make a statement. Uh, uh, whether they are reliable. So this group of people will not work on making uh, new reliable AI methods, but methods to establish that AI is reliable. It's sort of a meta level here. This is the list of partners in the project. Uh, I think I'll spare you going through all of them. Uh, many of these partners have already presented today or yesterday. Uh, so I seem to be in the right company. Uh, you can see both uh, marine robotics institutes and uh, general robotics and AI institutes, uh, but also formal methods. And you can also see companies that do software for underwater uh, machines like IVA. You can see BFKI in Bremen who uh, have excellent experience in uh, prototyping, uh, prototyping underwater uh, vehicles. Uh, you have a vision company, Kraken, and. Uh, maybe most, uh, and, and, and a vendor or ocean scan from Porto, uh, but also a certification and safety company, BNVGL, uh, in the marine space uh, in, from, uh, from Oslo, or Norway in general. So uh, we're quite a crowd, uh, but we also have uh, 15 young researchers to educate and to make progress in this space. I will not go through all the projects these 15 researchers will work on, uh, but I'll just mention that, as I said, they are grouped in these two streams, left and right. Uh, one is the people who know about robotics and AI. I will try to use these methods to make uh, to, Im to improve their reliability. And another group on the right is the projects uh, from software engineering and the formal methods that will apply these methods to uh, marine AI. So here we're talking about things like probabilistic testing, Bayesian reasoning, risk analysis, maybe model-based testing, uh, model checking and verification. Uh, maybe uh, from this audience perspective, I'm almost done. I promise to be short. Uh, from this project's perspective, maybe the interesting part is that uh, a large part of uh, such a PhD school that Marie Curie uh, funds, uh, or European Commission funds under the Marie Curie program, uh, is that we organize trainings. We are planning six PhD schools in the next three years, so roughly every half year, and two symposia at conferences uh, on various topics uh, that are uh, supposed to train our PhDs, but also uh, they, there will be open places or seats for external participants. So here we're talking both about topics from AI and robotics, like uh, basics of underwater robotics, vision, perception, underwater localization, knowledge, 3D semantics planning, but also uh, active learning, episodic memories, but also methods from uh, formal methods of testing, verification, model checking, uh, probabilistic assessment of decision making, risk analysis, etc. So uh, there'll be a lot of these events uh, organized sort of in a weekly, in a week long, uh, in week long PhD schools with experts uh, teaching uh, young researchers uh, the basics of these fields. Uh, so a good combination of general methods and marine robotics methods. And uh, 
Yep, as I'm saying, some of them will be, uh, or many of them will be open to external participation. So it might be something uh, you will be interesting to send uh, your engineers or your students to. And if that happens, that uh, I raised your attention uh, on this, we have uh, a way to register in something we call industry follower group, uh, which is a sort of a now traffic forum uh, allowing uh, companies and research labs to follow our work. We we'll occasionally send a newsletter, but most importantly, we will also give you information if any of our events uh, are open uh, to external participation. So if you are interested in our training offer uh, or uh, other research progress in this space, please write to Aina Brock Jonsen in Oslo. The email is on the screen, uh, who maintains the list of members of the industry follower group. And I think uh, I rushed it, but I'm done. Thank you. Okay, great, uh, Andre, for, for for the talk. Uh, very exciting. And uh, I would have one question. Oh, there's one question in the uh, in the chat from uh, Salvatore, uh, and maybe the um, technical uh, staff could uh, give the mic to Salvatore to present the question. Oh yes, just a simple question. Um, I, I heard that issues, some of the Remaros issues, I think, are the diffusion that emerged real time and other analysis and so on. But did you already uh, have an idea of the CONOPS and of the risk analysis process that you have to develop? Thank you. So I we don't uh, we don't have technical solutions right at this stage before we started we mostly have questions, uh, but uh, okay so I the, everything I'll say is speculation and and in particular the fusion part is not me the expertise is in DFKI, uh, but if I, I I mean what we what we know very well in the risk analysis part of the project is building probabilistic models so I would. And this is actually a standard method in safety analysis, right? You, you basically build a model which tries to predict uh, the probability of a defect. So for the fusion system, we would have to build a probabilistic model and analyze it. And we could analyze it uh, using model checking methods, but there are also maybe more amenable methods here like uh, Bayesian inference or probabilistic programming um, or classical statistics, uh, because this we can derived from experiments. Uh, methods like this can be derived from experiments. Of course, there's lots of problems because uh, uh, there is a limited amount of experiments we can run. So maybe a lot of this uh, inference has to be done based on simulation data. Uh, but uh, the good thing about Bayesian inference methods is that you can compose uh, multiple experiment results, right? So we can compose the results from simulation experiments with the results from uh, uh, physical experiments. I can't say anything more, uh, but if you're interested, I can connect you to the right person. Just yeah, get in touch. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would say if I would have uh, at least uh, two questions, but we will have time later for um, more discussion. Uh, so in the meantime, I would ask you and say to um, unshare the screen uh, and uh, we proceed with the fourth talk and we will learn more about the Blue Roses project presented by Massimo Caccia. Good morning, thank you very much uh, Jan for your introduction. So now it should be okay? Yes, and, uh, okay. Today I'm going to present the Blue Roses project that has been funded in the framework of the EMFF fund, and it deals with sustainable eco-friendly services for innovative marinas and leisure boats. And the project partnership is made by the Institute of Marine Engineering of an Italian National Research Council, the group of Professor Antonio Pascual in the Instituto Superior Technico of Lisbon, and uh, the cluster Navigo of, of uh, the 
that is basically the cluster of nautical in uh, Tuscany region in Italy and uh, a company uh, specialized in ICT and apps uh, development options net from Greece and Aninberg that is a small medium enterprise from uh, Spain dealing with uh, um, more economic suspects. And uh, what is uh, interesting in this project that uh, in addition to the partners of the project, we have a, a network uh, representing uh, more, a, lot, a large platea of uh, um, possible stakeholders, both in the advisory board, where we are uh, the pleasure to have Vincenzo Poerio, who was uh, the former CEO of Benetti Yachts and now of uh, Tanco Yachts, Justin Marley, who is well known to large part of our community and was uh, one of the first plenary speakers in the first edition of Emre in Rome, and uh, Professor Gregory Jovanov, who represents also a cluster in uh, Greece, and Simonetta Fraschetti representing the marine protected areas. We have also other maritime clusters, Maret VG and the LTM and cluster Marino Maritimo of Andalusia, Acaia Chamber of Commerce, and uh, different uh, um, stakeholders uh, involved in ocean literacy and also the project was uh, uh, supported from its beginning during the idea generation from the West Med assistance mechanism. And uh, the similar idea started from uh, considering that there are mature technology, both in marine robotics with the ROVs, AUVs, in uh, the development of IoT middleware, and the development of smart application apps for mobiles, phones, and so on. So the idea was to say, okay, how can we put all this technology together to think to new services? And when we wrote the project at the end of 2018, the scenario was completely different from now. So the trend was of an increasing pressure, anthro anthropic pressure on coastal areas due to tourism. And so we had to face the problem of how to guarantee a sustainable access to naturalistic and cultural underwater sites in a remote mode, and also how to allow robotic-based water and seabed monitoring inside marinas. So we have uh, two pilots basically focusing on that. And uh, what we made already during the um, writing of the proposal was uh, to try to match the needs that we have on one side for sustainability from economic, social, and environment aspects. So how to extend uh, marine tourist areas to coastal underwater sites, for instance, how to facilitate uh, maintenance of leisure boats and support innovation in main to maintain leadership in the yachting sector. But uh, it's, uh, for instance, in Italy, very, very important for our economy and for Mediterranean aspects and on the social aspects, how to facilitate access to tourist sites by elderly and disabled people, how to share environmental data and their acquisition with the public, and also how to allow non-invasive access to fragile sites and uh, facilitate access to sources of pollution. But on the other side, we had uh, the technologies that I mentioned before, and uh, the idea was uh, to think to new services and products such as remote access to tourist underwater sites, design of leisure boats integrating underwater robotic tools, and also robotic assets uh, out and monitoring of marina waters and seabed. So on this basis, we define some possible objectives for the project from technology, general technology objective of a developing a prototype middleware architecture and the tools for connecting marine robots to leisure boats on board automation, marinas, IT infrastructures, and smart devices for every people at home and everywhere in the world. So we thought to some service objectives as a remote access to naturalistic and or cultural underwater sites, that is pilot one of the project, 
robotic based water sensi bed monitoring inside marinas, that is pilot two. And uh, regarding yacht health inspections and monitoring, and uh, this is uh, something that we only will study during the project. We have also possible projects, uh, uh, possible products related uh, as uh, how to integrate uh, robotic tools uh, in. Uh, uh, leisure boats, and then we have the dissemination and communication objectives related to promote awareness of new business models and market opportunities in blue economy related to ICT technology, and uh, how to increase public awareness of how the introduction of robots and IoT at sea can support economic growth and environmental sustainable use of marinas and coastal areas. But Mm, of course, the project that uh, started at the end of 2019 was uh, strongly impacted by uh, COVID pandemic. Or we could work in smart working mode and design the project, but we had uh, some delay due to uh, the possibility of performing tests, also preliminary tests at sea during the development phase of the project. So now we are post discussing with the commission an extension of six months to postpone pilots to 2022 spring. And also we had in some way to review the creation and the activities of the Blue Roses Lab interacting with stakeholders because we had to do it in a different way to what we thought at the beginning due to the COVID pandemic. And uh, uh, as I mentioned before, we plan to have uh, two pilots. One is uh, in Portugal, in the Ocean Revival Underwater Park in Algarve, where the group of Antonio Pascual uh, will use a Libera Fusion class ROV AUV vehicle. We saw this uh, vehicle in a very interesting and nice industrial presentation yesterday. And in Viareggio Harbor, we will work more with surface and underwater vehicle to understand how to apply this technology to water and seabed monitoring inside marinas. And uh, as I mentioned before, we had uh, in some way to rethink uh, the um, interaction with stakeholders and also the possibility of using robotics and IoT, ICT technology with the, the pandemic. So we started, as I mentioned before, thinking that uh, we design and develop technology to support sustainable touristic access to coastal areas in a scenario of worldwide growth of the tourism sector. Then there was COVID outbreak. And so the discussion was moved also to understand how technology can support tourist safety during pandemic while contributing to change touristic offer in order to make it more resilient to unforeseen emergencies. And uh, regarding that, also in uh, synergy with other projects as BlueMed, CSA, Interreg, Mediterranean Mistral, and WestMed Blue Economy Initiative. During last November, we organized also with the support of the Commission an online meeting about that, ICT services for post-COVID-19 blue tourism in the Mediterranean area. And also during this period, we started to work in the Blue Lab, uh, Blue Roses Lab, on a, a topic that is a, usually addressed in our community, that is the gender gap in marine robotics. So we diffuse a questionnaire to many of you, and we had a very, very large response because we contacted 31 group, research groups in Europe, and we had already answers from 27. I want to thank all of you for your cooperation to this initiative. And uh, I ask uh, also you if uh, 
you have research groups in marine robotics and you have not already been contacted to contact me and my colleague Ruth Sandra if you, because we would be very happy to try to provide to our community some quantitative data about a gap that we perceive, but we have not precise information about that. In any case, we some preliminary results. We have seven percent of research teams with no women. Almost thirty percent have no women researchers, because one thing that, in some way, we felt, but now we have also numbers. Many times, women are employed in our research groups, but on the management and administrative side, even if they have a degree and a background in engineering and technology. So we invite you to cooperate with us uh, to provide us data. We are organizing interviews uh, with uh, persons, in, women involved in uh, our community and our area to understand better that. And uh, we plan to have on this side a uh, breaking the surface event in the night in September in Croatia about women in blue, gender related challenges and opportunities in blue research. So, as I mentioned also yesterday, and uh, there were many projects that, uh, for instance, uh, Matrak uh, results are used in Blue Roses. Blue Roses results will be exploited in the Interreg. Italy Croatia in Nova Mare project, and as mentioned already this morning, uh, Fantina, the results will be used also in the Milestrom project. So here are uh, all the contacts, and uh, please follow us uh, in uh, the different uh, social media. And uh, thank you very much for uh, your uh, kind attention. Thank you very much, Massimo. and. Um... Uh, I have accepted uh, some uh, 30 seconds overtime uh, following the, the brilliant uh, aperitivo we had yesterday. <laughs> um, I will just check if there are any questions. I'm, I might have one. I was very intrigued with the uh, resilient uh, systems with respect to the COVID pandemic. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure I would sign on, on, on down on the page for virtual holidays, um, but uh, um, I would like to to learn more about the ideas behind this concept. How can a robotics application um, be um, resilient against and against the pandemia? Is it by uh, remote access, telepresence? And these concepts, uh, redu yeah, reduction of operators, reduction of people uh, in yeah, but, the, but also the there world. were some uh, very interesting ideas from nautical chartering, for instance, in Sardinia, because uh, they can host people on uh, sailing boats, for instance, and uh, to provide uh, some uh, also technical tools to them to make them greener. And uh, also in yachting, there are interesting uh, aspects because it is possible maybe to introduce uh, some uh, uh, technology also to uh, sustain uh, citizen science by people during their holidays. But uh, from the point of view of tourism, on the other side, what to also there were interesting studies made uh, some colleagues of the University in Trentino Alto Adige from uh, uh, social aspects. And uh, basically what people expect to do is to do the same things as before. And uh, it can be just a bit dangerous, but it is uh, on the other end, many related to human uh, mm -hmm. aspects of uh, all of us would like to have, uh, to go back to our normal life. Mm -hmm. But for tracing, for, uh, remote access and something like that, something is will be possible. And also, especially it will be easier to have a, to cope with some constraints that we have, because for instance, if you want to access to a remote size with, with an ROV from your, your own mobile, 
you have to wait your turn. You have to reserve it. And probably it was uh, more difficult in our mind one year ago. Now it is not more normal for us uh, to reserve something and so on. So we'll mm -hmm. see in the future. And uh, I hope uh, next year to present uh, interesting results in South Africa. Okay. So yeah. thanks, Jan. Thank you, Thank you Massimo. And I have more questions for, for later for the discussion. Uh, so we will come to the last talk of uh, uh, this session, and uh, it is about uh, an industrial research project, uh, which is the SPICE AUV, uh, run by Kawasaki UK, and it is uh, presented uh, by Mr. Men Menihiko Mukaida. I, I hope I pronounced this right. Uh, excuse me if not, and uh, please, the floor is, is yours. Yeah, can you hear me and... Uh, Perfectly. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, uh, thanks, Jan, uh, for kind introduction. Uh, and hello, everyone. I'm Minehiko Mukaida in Kawasaki Service UK. I'm very happy to have such a fantastic opportunity to present Kawasaki AUV Spice on behalf of Kawasaki Heavy Industries for EMRA 2021 today. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to explain about who is Kawasaki. Uh, motorcycle is the most famous product, I think, but uh, uh, as you can see, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, products uh, in this screen. Uh, Kawasaki Heavy Industry is uh, a heavy industry uh, in, uh, based in Japan. Uh, uh, headquarters is located in Tokyo and Kobe in Japan. And Kawasaki Service UK Limited, we are 100% subsidiary of uh, Kawasaki Heavy Industries, founded uh, in February 2019. Uh, our office is located in Aberdeen, UK. Uh, the purpose of uh, Kawasaki Service UK is to construct a good relationship with European service sectors and to promote Kawasaki's, uh, especially AUV technologies for the industry. So uh, that's why I'm uh, presenting for you today. Uh, background of development of Kawasaki AUV. Uh, we have a long history uh, of uh, manufacturing human occupied vehicles, especially submarines and submergible rescue vehicles. And we developed a demonstration type AUV, uh, Marine Bird, uh, in 20, uh, 2003 uh, and succeeded underwater docking and recharging at that time. And also uh, developed a uh, prototype AUV and docking station uh, for actual offshore operation demonstration uh, in 2017 uh, for commercial market. We proved our underwater docking and recharging capability using uh, the prototype AUV and station. Uh, we also have industrial robot uh, manufacturing uh, developing technology. So we collaborated uh, each of our technologies for our latest AUV spice. Concept of AUV spice. Uh, spice means uh, subsea uh, precise inspector with close eyes. SPICE is an AUV for subsea pipeline inspection from outside. Uh, SPICE has a portable docking station. Uh, SPICE can be moved deeper uh, with docking st station uh, from uh, surface. At the operation depth, SPICE can start to search and find subsea pipe automatically uh, and start uh, old pipeline tracking and uh, start kind of inspection. Uh, furthermore, uh, SPICE can carry out a kind of cross-range inspection using own robotics arm here. And uh, uh, inspection tool unit we call ITU, uh, located at the edge of robotics arm here. Uh, ITU uh, can fit uh, precisely on the top of the pipe uh, during AUV cruising. 
when uh, its battery uh, is low, uh, Spice can stop inspection task and return to the docking station. Uh, during docking, Spice can be recharged on battery and carry out data communication. Uh, so uh, Spice can uh, realize a long underwater operation uh, without frequent launch and recovery uh, from the deck of offshore supply vessel. Uh, we Kawasaki believe these technologies can contribute to realize reduction or optimization of subsea operation cost. Uh, in fact, you can see the concept movie on YouTube uh, anytime. So uh, Kawasaki carried out several sea trials to verify our developed technologies uh, last year, 2020, in Japan, especially uh, number three, <laughs> Kawasaki finished a comprehensive verification test in Awaji, Japan, uh, in June 2020. Uh, we laid a simulated pipe uh, over 500 meters, uh, and we prepared several events, obstacles, such as covered zone and crossing pipe zone and uh, mock-up anode, uh, uh, such kind of uh, obstacles, events we prepared for uh, the verification test. Uh, summary of the comprehensive uh, verification test uh, founded by uh, Nippon Foundation and supervised by oil major R&B cluster, uh, deep star in Houston. Uh, total trial hours, distance, and the number of tests were uh, uh, like uh, this screen. Uh, typical sequence at the verification test, uh, launch with AUB, uh, uh, sorry, uh, AUB uh, launched uh, with station and departure from station. After that, we conducted auto detecting test and tracking test after that. Uh, AUV uh, carried out auto approach and auto docking to docking station. Uh, during docking, uh, recharging high data transferring communication were conducted. And when we finished uh, the test, uh, we recovered AUV with station, like uh, this picture. Result of auto detection test, uh, AUV started at altitude about seven meters. AUB found and recognized pipe uh, using imaging sonar and our uh, pipe detecting algorithm. Once AUB detected the pipe, AUB moved lower to target altitude and turned to the right direction uh, against pipe to start uh, auto tracking, utilizing profiling sonar and our pipeline tracking algorithm. And the tracking test result, we proved high stability of ITU movement at several uh, cruising speed. And uh, at that time, there was a tidal current, maximum 1.4 knot from uh, side of AV body. Uh, even if the condition, uh, the result of ITU's contact rate was uh, around 90% of the condition. At the same time, we also confirmed uh, the performance of avoiding all obstacles uh, in the test. I'm showing one example, crossing pipe area. Uh, now uh, arm is moving up to avoid contact with the obstacle. So we tried to carry out several pipeline inspection processes, uh, like convention, conventional AUB. Uh, we created 3D images and took high resolution uh, photographs. Uh, and uh, we also took pictures and movies from both sides of camera mounted on robotics arm. And furthermore, uh, we, uh, Kawasaki, are now developing uh, the suitable non-destructive test method for, for the ITU. Of course, we have decided uh, several candidates uh, for, for our ITU. Uh, finally, uh, I want to tell you, uh, we Kawasaki hope to uh, contribute to not only subsea pipeline inspection field, but also other oil and gas and uh, renewable energy field. 
and uh, oceanographic field, of course, uh, using our developed uh, technologies in the future. Uh, today, I presented SPICE's development activity in the uh, last year, uh, in last year, sorry, and capabilities uh, briefly. However, I have more detailed information. Uh, if you are interested in our activities, uh, please contact me. Uh, my email address is here. I'm happy if you will contact me in the future. Uh, that's all my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, Meneko. This is uh, very interesting and uh, um, maybe oh, there, there are questions coming up and uh, I'm eager to present my, my own questions um, in the AUV design and uh, so I would have some questions as well. Uh, the first question though is, uh, um, I need the chat box. Um, uh, the question is uh, from Salvatore Mauro, so uh, technical staff, could you give the, the, the mic to Salvatore, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks, Mimeiko, for your very impressive uh, presentation. I have some questions about the design, the hydrodynamic design of your SPICE platform. As industry, you must be very careful in order to, to try to fix endurances and capability, operative capabilities of your, of your platform. So did you um, test different uh, rubber and screw propellers for your platform in order to fix the best solution between um, endurance controllability, maneuverability, and um, uh, motions of your platform. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, to develop our SPICE, uh, we have carried out uh, uh, CFD calculation. And uh, we also carried out uh, fluid dynamics uh, test uh, in our uh, test facility. Uh, so uh, we uh, so improved uh, the no nose shape of uh, our AV body, by for example. And uh, we also simulated, uh, how can I say, uh, the shape and size of uh, ladder uh, to, to, to optimize our AV's movement, a combination of thrusters. Uh, our AV has several thrusters and ladders. Uh, so uh, to find uh, uh, optimized condition, uh, we, we, we uh, simulated and calculated such kind of study. Uh, is, is it make sense? for your question? Yeah, 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 it makes sense. Yes, it, it makes perfect sense. But so uh, if it's only CFD uh, proof of your capability, well, uh, I, I, am, I am a researcher in experimental uh, field. So uh, I, I can suggest you to, to try to fix also from the experimental point of view, the capability of your. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Maybe I ask a question on my side. Uh, so when you use uh, uh, hovering AUVs, uh, the maneuverability is, is often uh, the most critical at low speed. Uh, and the, the weighing of the vehicle and the apparent weight or buoyancy is, is uh, most uh, tricky uh, at low speed because uh, the driving uh, platforms and uh, the, the driving planes, are, steering planes, are, are not fully efficient. Uh, is the SPICE AUV provided with ballasting system to trim uh, for the, the uh, apparent weight, uh, or is it statically uh, trimmed uh, before the dive? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, uh, the SPICE we uh, used the verification test uh, has a ballast release, ballast and ballast release, ballast release system for emergency 
surfacing. And uh, uh, the spice we used, the verification test, uh, did not have a kind of trim, trim adjust system. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, we Kawasaki uh, has a long history to uh, manufacture and develop uh, human occupied uh, vehicle, uh, especially uh, submergible rescue vehicle. So uh, we, 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 we are understanding uh, the importance of trim mm -hmm. uh, system. And we know, we have uh, several know-hows to, to realize such kind of system. But depending on size and uh, energy, uh, sorry, uh, uh, energy consumption and the size and the weight, uh, so far uh, for the spice, we, we do not uh, apply volume uh, adjusting system. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks again for this great talk. Um, I'm looking at the chat for other questions. We are almost at the end of the session, but the organizer allowed me to overshoot a little bit. Uh, I'm, I would have a question for um, um, uh, Andre for the uh, um, reliability of an artificial intelligence. Do you see the uh, real, real reliability, excuse me, reliability issues rather in a learning process or in the execution of previously learned uh, behavior? I, I see them in, in both places, right? So, uh, but I, I think, uh, okay, I cannot, no, how should I respond to this? I mean, the short answer is I see them in both places, although I actually, I am conservative here. So I, I believe the industry needs more methods for uh, the execution phase, uh, because I don't believe uh, online learning in safety critical situations is something we will deploy uh, commonly very soon. I would, uh, I would rather like, uh, I would like the machines that are trained offline and then execute it, uh, execute it separately to behave well. If we can do that, then I think learning comes later. So I, I am in favor of baby steps here, but the problem is obviously in both places. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, right. I believe we, we are getting to the end, but I would uh, maybe ask each of the speakers uh, a, a very quick response. Um, I see that the maybe one common point in your presentations in this session is reliability uh so um uh could you each in really a very short quick answer uh say a word about what are the the biggest issue r d has to tackle in order to uh increase reliability in your project in your field of uh, application Maybe we start, uh, we go backwards and we start uh, uh, with uh, Minehiko and then we go backwards to the list of speakers. Sorry, I, I couldn't catch you, your question. Uh, okay, my question is in your project and in your application, uh, what is the uh, biggest issue uh, when it comes to reliability? Reliability. Okay. So, uh, so as I explained, uh, now we are, are concentrating to contribute uh, for offshore oil and gas industry. Uh, you know, uh, the uh, safety level of uh, oil and gas companies very high and very, very, very difficult to enter, uh, uh, like, like our uh, new uh, technology. So, uh, so uh, we, we uh, I and uh, our company need to explain and to make, to make them to uh, uh, how can I say? Uh, 
to,、uh, to make to,、uh, to make them、uh, Kawasaki has、uh, reliable、uh, company and Kawasaki has reliable technology. It is、uh, the most challenging uh, uh, for, for, for us、okay. so far. Yeah. Okay, thank you. It is zero tolerance of the customer in, in the oil and gas field. I acknowledge that. Okay.、Um, Massimo? In、uh, the applications I, I showed today and yesterday in these projects related to arbor water monitoring, coastal areas, and so on, basically we are dealing with、uh, remotely supervised or、uh, controlled systems. And、uh, so, one bottleneck from that point of view is the communication infrastructure. And so, we need, in any case, to develop systems with、uh, some internal checks and controls for being able to work in a safe way, even if、uh, we lose communication and it is not possible for the remote user to comment them. And、uh, another aspect is related when you operate in the arbors to. Uh, establish procedures to be able to work with these small vehicles in a compliant way with、uh, arbor activities. Because if there are large ships and so on, they are very, very dangerous for the robots, of course. On the other side, we, especially with the surface vehicle, we reduced uh, uh, a lot the, the safety problems because.、Uh, Due to the special、uh, propulsion with the pump jet inside the hulls and uh, the, um, the hull made of、uh, foam, there are no risks for people around. And so the risk, and also for damaging, for instance,、uh, boats、uh, that are in the arbors and so on, the risks are all for the robots itself. Okay, thank you.、Um, Andre, something to add to what we discussed before? So, I start、uh, at a similar point where Massimo started.、Uh, I think,、uh, you know, in all other machinery outside、uh, marine and robotics, there is always,、uh, it's very always, it's always important that there is a reliable safety function. And that safety function has to be simple and trustworthy. And you all have seen it a big red button, right? That、uh, stops a mobile vehicle, a ground vehicle, reliably and、uh, The steady state is safe. You just、uh, stop the machine, and it's safe, right? So I think one challenge that is here is to to have a way for underwater vehicles、uh, to have a reliable safety function that doesn't involve the complexity of the entire system. Something that would, could be developed and certified for once. And many other machines are very complicated, but it's only the safety function that has to be reliable and certified for safety in a way. Uh, so, if we could separate、uh, in the design of underwater vehicles the safety function、uh, as a reusable component or a reusable design, that would be a big success, I think.、Uh, and maybe the other thing that is also seen in other areas of engineering would be very nice now, closer to my sort of project, it would be to, to figure out some compositional ways of、uh, reasoning about reliability. So, so that you could say, okay, We could put an expected failure rate on this perception component, and we can propagate it through the design of the system to see how likely it is that, I don't know, it will collide if it uses this perception component, et cetera.、Uh, so, uh, so that you could basically stop doing the entire analysis of safety for a system as a whole, but, but could rely on, on, on safety of components to,、uh, to, to more easily assess the safety of the system. Yes.、Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.、Um, Fabio? Yes, in our case, since we, our end users are mainly diving centers and archaeologists, it is very, let's say, important to have a reliable system that could work for years without any less intervention from the scientists that could be, or the producer that could be hundreds or thousands of kilometers far away. So, you need the, our guidelines when we design these kind of systems, both VR in the museums and,、uh, and uh, let's say, tablets and vehicles and the world, is just one button to turn on and off, just one connector to easily recharge the batteries,、uh, put the number of functions as, as less as possible and the interaction as easy as possible. 
in order to allow the people to start work playing, let's say, allow me this term, to start people playing with the system in uh, one minute, let's say. The learning time should be this one for if you do it in a museum or in a diving center with the tourists. So these are guidelines very strict <laughs> that we have to follow for institute development in our case. Okay, thank you. No hassle, no troubleshooting. <laughs> we, exactly. we get this. And uh, we uh, finish with Daniele. Well, <clears throat> for sure, the, we we meet uh, all uh, the same the same problems. I mean, uh, for sure that the um, power uh, units uh, are the, are the problem. These battles uh, age uh, quickly and so on, and the communication is also a, a big issue. Uh, at least for us uh, who want to integrate uh, the the sensors uh, in an automatic uh, alerting uh, network because uh, even if we can recover later, as if we have to send the alert at the right time, this is the, the big issue. Uh, the, only, the only way we had uh, to cope with it was redundancy, learning from nature. And uh, this is because uh, we cannot, uh, well, we, we, we never found a way to guarantee over a certain uh, the threshold, the, um, the reliability. Also because uh, our main uh, intent is uh, to provide uh, solutions that are affordable uh, because uh, a large part of uh, the countries facing the Mediterranean Sea cannot invest a um, huge amount of money. And even if they are very prone to this uh, tsunami or the, uh, similar uh, similar events. Uh, therefore, uh, we prefer to have uh, more low-cost devices than uh, uh, very expensive, so reliable ones. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, time is up. Thank you very much for the great talks, all the five of you, and uh, for the good discussion. And thanks to the organizer to let us overshoot a couple of minutes uh, but it was worthwhile, I think, for the discussion.